is um somebody named Mary Lou seems to be the owner of this. Does anybody know this person? Okay, well I'll I'll ask again. Um, Check one two. Okay. If you if you see her, please mention. Okay, everybody, we're about to get started with the report backs from the workshop. So um, I just want to thank everybody for their energy level. This has been an amazing conference. Um, I went to a couple of workshops myself, and um, the enthusiasm and the spirit and the hope that's here is really inspiring. So we're going um, to carefully watch the time here. We're going to go in the order that is here we're going to start with the six 130 workshops five minutes max if you can go a little less than five minutes that's awesome um, do not go more than five minutes and um, we're going to we're going to ask hopefully each group has designated one person to um, to be the report back if you have not please just sort of make eye contact with your um, workshop leader or maybe figure out that i think the workshop leader can then figure out what to do, but we want one person to just share with all of us what was discussed and what was resolved and what um, what we can all take away from that. So we are going to start with um, the, sorry, one sec. Okay. Um, upgrade, upgrading the kellogg Brian Pact with Kent Shifford and D David Swanson, and actually um, this, there is, there are 20 copies right here of the draft treaty to um, replace the Kellogg Briand. And um, they're up there if anybody would like to take them. And um, I'm going to call up David Swanson to um, quickly represent his group. Is David here? Up there. So I completely blew it and did not ask for a volunteer at the start of the workshop to do the report back. Uh, and I asked many afterwards and didn't get one. So here's a very quick uh, report back from me. Uh, it was going to be an interesting debate because I don't want to replace the Kellogg-Briand Pact. I want to make people aware of it and get nations to abide by it. Uh, and, uh, and, and Kent's view is, is a different one, uh, but he wasn't there. Uh, we we could, I think, be doing a lot more to educate people, as has already been discussed at this conference, to the fact that war is illegal. And, of course, it's illegal under the UN Charter with exceptions. If it's somebody claims it's defensive or it's authorized by the UN Security Council. And despite the fact that most of these wars, none of these recent wars, meet either of those loopholes, People imagine that maybe they do or probably they do. And so holding up the kellogg Briand Pact and saying, hey, there's also a law on the books that bans all war with no exceptions. And this nation and that nation and most big nations on earth are party to it is, is something we could make use of. And we could do education around it. We could get non-party states to join the kellogg Briand Pact that never have and ask the already existing members to start complying with it. We could, uh, we could draft model domestic legislation for penalties for individuals for violating it. We could democratize the International Court and the International Criminal Court and pursue prosecutions. We could democratize the UN and pursue various types of sanctions. We could treat the Hague Convention of 1907 as also being an existing law and in combination with the Kellogg-Briand Pact, which requires nonviolent dispute resolution, it, it, it require the specific nonviolent dispute resolution in the, in the Hague Convention. Uh, 
all kinds of, of activities we could be uh, engaging in uh, around the fact that we have a law on the books that bans all war. Uh, and much as I would like to create another law that bans all war, it seems a little bit harder and it seems to water down laws that we already have when we create new ones uh, to do it again. Uh, we've had torture banned I don't know how many times in the United States with new exceptions each time, just as the United Nations re-banned war but with exceptions, meaning that it actually legalized war in, in in certain the United Nations Charter uh, so anyway that's that's probably more than a minute or two or whatever I said so thank you mark all right thank you to the first group um, so the next one I, I believe these are their posters so I guess they just didn't work very hard um, so this is um, disrupting the business models of war with Peter Jones um, OCAD University and Stephen and you are the reporter? Yeah, um, well, okay. I'm not the reporter. I'm, I'm the organizer for the conference. Where's, where's my friend from Halifax? Does she want to join us? Uh, okay, where's my friend from Halifax who's going to report if she's here here? Um, but if not, um, I can get started and, and, and do the report. I was going to share it. So our, our workshop um, generated the, um, the sketches that you see behind me. The, these are called business model canvases, and they're a way of mapping out the business structure for different industry sectors in what we call the business model of war. So there, are, we had uh, an overflowing room um, and we're able to kind of contain the conversation by, by constructing um, six or seven of these, of these um, maps or business models that represent how different uh, industry sectors or in this case, uh, the one on the left, the top left, is the media um, a, as an industry sector that supports, uh, that has its own business model interconnected with uh, the war industry. Um, we have um, the weapons industry, extractive industries, you know, mining and the colonization of mining, oil, finance, um, and, and, and others all together in the same room. So, so this is a participatory workshop where you know, a lot. Uh, some was learned in plenary that as we generated the the ideas that led to these industry sectors, and then kind of taught the method where people could then work in groups and and map out what you see in these these categories, which are what you know what's the value proposition. In other words, what value is thought to be created for um, you know for a problematic industry that is that is supporting. Um, you know, they're supporting the military, industrial, media, stink tank complex. And so we took each one of those kind of sectors out, mapped out the, uh, Medea Benjamin's term, the um, uh, value proposition, which is what are the different, and that's in the center. You see there's quite a bit of value that's thought to be created for these customers. It may not be for us, but for the customers of these business models. So you've got customer segments and the relationships on the, on the right, and on the left of each one of these, the key partners. So one of the things you'll notice, and that was discovered in the workshop, was that for each one of these industry sectors, the key partners line up. So they're all connected. You start to really see how revenues are generated, you know, or actually we didn't map them all out yet to the point where you could see how government spending um, you know, feeds into the weapons industry, which has a revolving door with direct interconnected directorships, which uses the media to promote the next incursion, which may be an oil or an extractive industry support, which may also have a foreign policy component, and that the directors and CEOs are all interconnected and, and they're fina all financed through the banks, which provides liquidity and investment returns back to shareholders and we need to understand these relationships if we're going to inter intervene, interfere, disrupt and transform the economy that is driven by, you know, by the war machine. So I mean just, you know, it's it distorts everything in the economy just in the second quarter report this year uh, as of Jul July 2018. There was a positive GDP report in the U.S. and stocks went up and everything. But if you took defense spending 
in defense industries, I guess, actually defense industry out of that report, um, factory orders and in GDP declined uh, in the summer. So it's an artificial economy in a sense that we're implicates all of us. And that's one of the insights that came out of this is that, you know, we're all, all of us as citizens in the US and Canada are all part of this. We're all, we can't escape it. Our pension funds contribute to it. The, you know, our, our economy is unfortunately completely implicated in it. We need, so this helps us find out where we can intervene, where we might find places to, to start really displacing and redirecting this type of economy. So hopefully those insights came out from the participants. Awesome, thank you. Okay, um, next up, departments and other national infrastructures for peace, a way forward with Saul Arbes and Ann Kreter. I hope I pronounced that right. Um, who is reporting from that? There you are. Hello, I'm Karen Johnson from the U.S. Campaign for a Department of Peace Building, and I'm reporting for the group. So we had mostly people from Canada there and some people from other countries. And I was reminded of this morning, we heard we are living in exciting times where we can become global citizens or descend into chaos. And I've heard years ago that the way that um, we choose to organize as a society is reflected in our government. So especially we in the United States and Canada uh, have an opportunity and maybe a responsibility to work for infrastructures for peace building in our government. So as we were discussing different aspects of what does it mean for an infrastructure, uh, we had questions arise. And essentially we talked about that a, a Department of Peace would lay groundwork for peace and create the environment for uh, more peace building in a peaceful society. So one of the first questions that arose is, why don't we have it now? It makes sense, why don't we have it? So we talked about building a political will for peace. And we talked about specifically, and if people don't have pen and paper out, and you're from Canada or the United States, we'd like you to jot down a few things. <laughs> so please get that out if you can. Um, you know that you have a new ambassador for women, peace, and security. Uh, the possibility that that person might not have as much power and clout as most people here would like that person to have came up. And so the suggestion to write to uh, status of women minister Monsef, and Global Affairs Minister Christia Freeland came up, and your own MP, and there was a difference of opinion whether it would make a difference to write to Trudeau, so that's up to you, but to just talk about that you'd like this new position to have some clout and some power and importance in the government. Uh, so then we also talked about what are the other things that have to happen culturally to contribute toward uh, that a will for peace building and for infrastructures for peace, whatever they might look like in each country around the world. And we talked about uh, redefining peace and security, what that looks like, securing a common future, a comprehensive definition of disarmament, redirecting military budgets to education, peace education, uh, peace trainings. It came up about there being a certified peace professional here in Canada and the person wondered how do you get that, there's not really a, a curriculum and so forth, so we understand that it's mainly, um, the certification happens from field studies and that there are universities with trainings, but increasing those trainings, uh, the point was made that we have military cadets that uh, interest young people as young as 13 with travel and the promise of a job to have that counterpart where there would be opportunities in peace building for young people uh, that would attract them in that way. We also heard from a young man from an African country who is now in Canada, um, directly result from the advocacy that he was doing in his country uh, and concern for his safety as a result of that. We had a man from a different African country come to the U.S. conference a few years ago and express that they have to meet in secrecy for their own safety to work toward an infrastructure for peace building. And he asked the question, 
if the U.S. can't do it, how can we expect to do it? So other countries that don't have the freedoms that sometimes we might take for granted to discuss how do we change our governments, um, where they are seen as criticizing the government if you're asking for change in the government, are looking to us to make strides in creating these infrastructures for peace. And so we do that by writing to our representatives. The suggestion was made to have Saul Arnes lead uh, annual trips uh, and advocacy days with Parliament, much like we do in the U.S. And we have advocacy days in the U.S. immediately following this. I'm flying out in the morning to go to D.C. and we have three days where we're meeting with representatives and looking for new co-sponsors to the pending legislation there. So that's how we're looking at uh, trying to change the trajectory or increase the possibility that instead of descending into chaos in future years, we will become global citizens. Great. Uh, we're doing perfect on time. If we can keep it up this way, we'll actually finish right on time, which would be great. Um, next will be War Tax Resistance, Legality, Practicality, Value with Doug Hewitt White. Who is that? Who is that? Come on up. Oh, right. So I'm Francis. I'm from upstate New York. Um, I went to the tax resistance workshop, um, and we basically went over um, a bunch of the historical attempts, um, a bit of info about um, the the how the military complex is funded in Canada, um, and then into a discussion of whether it was a uh, um, a legal thing, or should it be legal? Um, whether it was practical, and um, and what kind of value this would have. Um, currently, uh, tax resistance is not legal in Canada. It doesn't mean that it doesn't happen, um, but it's it's difficult for those who do it because um, they they are um, they get legal action taken against them, or so on. Um, um, but actually, back in the 1850s, it was legal to conscientiously object against um, paying taxes for um, military spending in Canada. This is before Canada was a state. It was a colony of Britain. And um, um, it was for Quakers and Mennonites. And it, was, uh, uh, it drew a lot of immigrants from America because in, in the land of touted religious freedoms, uh, these people could not... Uh, legally not pay for things that were against their religion. Um, so, um, but that went away when the ability to not pay taxes for military went away when Canada became a state. Um, and a little bit of facts about uh, Canadian military. 49% um, of its funding is from personal income tax. Um, in 2016 to 2017, 26 million dollars went to military funding, um, and it's just 8.2 percent of all Canadian expenditures on the federal level. Um, and also, just a little bit of uh, a clarity about tax resistance: um, it's it's not tax avoidance and it's not tax evasion. It's specifically um, an act of civil civil disobedience with the intent of um, showing that you won't approve and you don't want your money to go towards um, these killings, um, killings of people. Um, so um, oftentimes tax resistors want to pay for peace, not for war. Um, and the whole idea of tax resistance is just to starve the military basically with, um, with um, not providing them any funding. Um, um, 
Um, so there are initiatives in Canada, US, and UK, and maybe other countries to try to legalize um, uh, not paying for uh, not paying military taxes. Um, uh, none of them have been successful so far, but it, at least from my opinion, it seems like it would be uh, uh, they have good legal perspectives because um, conscientious objectors um, for military service is legal in the United States and other places. Um, so it doesn't really seem like much of a difference to be a conscientious objector financially. Um, and then I'd say um, basically there's, we went over some doubts and disagreements about it, things you might, things that might come up um, with people that you talk about this issue with. Um, but then kind of the, the conclusion that we came to at the end um, is that, at least for us, it seemed like a very, um, it seemed like a practical thing for us to do. Um, legal, not so much, but we're working on it. And it seemed to have a lot of value because we could, um, it's a way to influence people and get them to, get them to know about the war issue, which seems to be seems to be one of the largest issues relating to war is just allowing people to know about it more. It seems like so few people know that it's uh, such a huge part of our budget and it has so many inherently uh, inherently negative effects. Um, and so that really the work that needs to get done is, is to shift us away from a culture of war, away towards a culture of peace and that um, potentially tax resistance is a good way to spread this message and, and to work towards that. Thank you. Next up, Citizen Action Using the Law with Daniel Turp and Gail Davidson. Hi, I'm Margaret Flowers, and um, this was a workshop that was done by Gail Davidson and Daniel Turp. Uh, Professor Turp started out by giving some examples of cases that he filed um, to try to, uh, there were a number of different ones, to try to, to find some legal remedy domestically that they didn't win, but just the fact of bringing them up brought attention to the issues, and that was a, a positive in its end in itself. Um, they said that when you decide that you have a situation you're concerned about, that the first step that you want to do is to introduce it or, or see if there's a, a domestic remedy. So you have a concern about some violation of law. Um, you would look and see if there's a domestic uh, law that would apply to that. And then if not, that would give you the basis to then go to an international court and seek a remedy there, because often they say they'll ask you first if you've done, uh, looked domestically. Um, they said whenever you're going to um, submit a complaint, it's important that you make sure that you have factual information and that you've looked to see if there's a legal basis for your complaint. You don't have to actually show that you have a winning case, but you do want to not abuse the law. You do want to actually make sure that there is some legal basis for the complaint that you're filing. Um, they talked about the importance of getting as much information as you can and how this can be really difficult, especially when we're talking about war. Um, a lot of information is not available. Journalists are not allowed in. So it's important to do what you can to work with civil society groups and try to get firsthand information that even hearsay is uh, useful because what you're trying to do is gather enough information about what is going on so that you can then submit that report or that complaint to the body and get them to actually become interested and want to look into it further. And they also talked about the fact that these bodies like the International Criminal Court uh, or the United Nations rely a lot on civil society groups to do that initial work, that initial investigation to bring issues to their attention. Um, so then once you've gathered your information, you think there's a legal basis for what your, for your complaint, 
then say if you're going to be uh, looking internationally, you can go to the International Criminal Court website or other you know, international bodies' websites and find the criteria that they have in terms of what language it's submitted in, what uh, specifics they require, any timelines that they have. So they said that information is readily, pretty readily available. One thing that's interesting is that if you go the, go the domestic route, then that's often a more expensive type of route because you need to hire lawyers and whatnot to help you with your case. But if you go internationally, an individual or an organization can submit a report or complaint internationally and there's no cost for doing that and in fact if you do that then they are required to respond to your complaint. Uh, finally we started talking about a few specific cases. There was a question about uh, could we go after the legal basis of using special forces, of Canada using special forces and uh, the response to that was that probably not domestically, there's probably not a domestic remedy for that, but that you could look and see if there is some violation of international law. There's also a question about non-state actors, uh, an entity like Al-Qaeda, and the reality is that international law only applies to organizations or individuals, so in that, I mean not organizations, nations or individuals, so in that situation you would actually have to focus on individuals within Al-Qaeda and show that they had violated some sort of law. Then finally, uh, we talked about the importance of having some sort of a network for this, that it would be helpful when individuals and activists are, you know, see a situation, are concerned about it, and want to challenge it legally, that it would be great to have a network where we could share that information out more widely, get input from a number of people, and then also get, you know, support for it, more people endorsing or participating in that effort just to give it more strength. And so uh, currently, I guess, uh, Gail Davidson has an organization. Uh, let me get involved, right? Yeah, thank you. Lawyers Rights Watch Canada. Um, but that, you know, there could be more of this kind of work, uh, this types of networks to help strengthen our using a legal basis to challenge what's happening. Okay, here's the one I attended, World Peace Through World Citizenship and the Global Rule of Law with David Gallup. Come on down. By the way, we have your hands. I have a couple of other announcements, um, which I'll do right after this one. Thank you. Hi, I'm David Gallup. I work at World Service Authority, and if you spent the noon hour watching the film on Gary Davis that Arthur presented, that's the organization where I work. So I felt at the workshop that I should tell you more about Gary, about that we, the work that we do on a day-to-day -day basis at World Service Authority to help stateless people, to help refugees, why these issues are so important. Plus, I kind of feel like that people don't completely get the idea of world citizenship enacted on a day-to-day -day basis. So I felt that I needed to spend a lot of time with that. So I'm about to give a cr critique of the, of the uh, workshop here in just a moment, which I think is important, because I do like to listen from the people who participate and, uh, and incorporate the those ideas in the next time I do this. So uh, my goal was to ask, what are the most important questions of the, of the 21st century? My thoughts were there's really two, because Gary Davis would always ask this to everyone he spoke with, which are, who are we? and how do we ensure the survival of humanity and the earth. So to who are we, of course, I would say we are all world citizens, human beings first and foremost, and to how do we ensure survival of humanity and the earth, we say, well, if we can see the world as one and start to create these structures of law at the global level that will help us to live together peacefully, that will ensure the survival of humanity and the earth. So now uh, the critiques. <laughs> um, we didn't have enough time to talk about what everyone else thought were the most important questions of the 21st century, so I'm sorry. Uh, but I did have people fill out cards, and I will be looking at those. But some people did bring up ideas of, of capitalism, and, and uh, I, gave an I gave, showed a, a commercial from Coca-Cola, which had a, a lot of people up in arms and upset. Uh, the commercial was about borders, um, uh, and 
it wasn't about Coca-Cola at all, but I, I take that and I completely understand why you might uh, not want to see a capitalistic product presented in a peace conference, perhaps, even if, the, even if the idea was to show how borders are ridiculous. How, and what I wrote on the board was, if you uh, um, write the word border and you take off the B, that equals order, which is what we need in the world is, is order, not borders. Um, people, so we, we should have talked more about what everyone else thought were the most important questions, which related, to, though, to uh, capitalism, nationalization, uh, nationalism, the environment, uh, globalization. Uh, someone brought up the idea that it's hard. We are so brainwashed to see ourselves as you know, Canadian or American or Ghanaian or whatever. That's how do you build the consensus or the idea to be world citizens? That's not easy because we're so brainwashed to, to not think that way. So that was a good critique. Uh, and then uh, the fact that I brought up um, common world law and common world citizenship and structures of law in a very male, patriarchal way, perhaps, that, that it should have been more, um, less Euro-patriarchal in how we develop these structures and much more come from indigenous populations and come from uh, women in particular, too. So thank you for these suggestions, which I will incorporate uh, the next time I, I speak about world citizenship and world law and how we bring them to, to the world to educate the world about these ideas. Thank you. Um, and just real quick, um, Arthur is the director of the, this awesome movie, and you just wanted to... Okay. Yes. Um, we were uh, very, uh, very pleased to have a great turnout for the movie and excitement about collaborating with us in helping to build a way to get this film to the world. Uh, we were showing the film, The World is My Country, and people were intrigued, I think, for three key reasons. One, because the power of story, Gary's story is so charming and intriguing that it can draw new people in to work on your world beyond war and all the different organizations you're working on. It can be a tool to draw people in. Uh, two, because it was so uh, uh, empowering, because Gary says, we don't have to sit around waiting for governments. We, the people, are the most powerful force in the world. And, we can create our own way of governing our planet with the powerful tools of the internet. And three, uh, because it's an organizing tool, as I was saying, something you can use in your community. <clears throat> and what we have, we only have three of these kits left, but this banner uh, is part of a, a kit that was 300, so had reduced to 150, and it's really only available here at the conference. They've assured it that the company that makes these that you can carry them on board with you, no problem going back to TSA, and that it includes this this banner, uh, digital kit of flyers, publicity photos from the film, press releases, instructions on how to build it, blurbs for your, uh, for your newsletter, uh, a trailer to put on your website. So there's a whole organizing kit. And the thing is that we haven't raised the, we only been able to license the incredible historic footage for film festivals. Uh, we haven't been able to afford the 50,000 we need to license it to get it on PBS and on TV and, on, and get it out in theaters and so on. And so we want a partnership with World Beyond War and with all of you to do that. So what we're doing is making available these fundraising screeners as part of this kit with the whole kit and boodle. Or if you want to get the DVD only for home screens, just have meetings in your home where you help raise funds for us and you. The, the, the whole kit's 150. This is only, these are 25 Canadian, 20 US for the DVD, but you do have to sign the agreement that's for home screening so that we're covered legally, especially because we don't have a right to sell them publicly yet. And we also have on the table right around the corner, we have lots of t-shirts uh, that say I'm a world citizen, either the big ones or the little ones. And that's also a way you can help the film. And it's a great thing to take home with you. You'll see them all laid out in the different sizes. And they're also 25 and 20. Uh, uh, and it's all, that's all a reduced price. Like online, if you buy it after, it's 35 plus shipping. And there's Gary's amazing book, The World is My Country, for only 10. So you can help us build this partnership, get the film out to the world. And we're here. We've made these kits for you. There's only three of those left. So uh, thank you for those who watched it. We loved your reaction. And, and we want to together build a world beyond war. Yes, question. Good <laughs> yes. That's very good film. Mm -hmm. like, OK, um, we actually have to move on, though. We, it's we're a very away. good film. It definitely is a great film. Um, <laughs> I've enjoyed Thank it you. too. Okay, um, just a quick announcement. Um, these, we would like to um, conserve these because we will be doing this conference again. So on your way out today or tomorrow, whenever you're leaving, 
Um, there will be a place to drop these off, and it will help us at, and w in what we do if you drop these off rather than taking them home and throwing them out. So thank you. Um, so next up, now we're going to the 3 p.m. workshops. And they we're going to start with Organizing 101, strategy, strategy, Intersectionality, and Millennials with Greta Zaro. Who is um, speaking for that? Is Greta here? Oh, great. Are you coming down to? Great. Hello. Good afternoon. We're going to do it as a pair uh, in the spirit of uh, unity and camaraderie, I guess. Um, my name is Kumail. Uh, it's like the analogy I usually use is Gmail, but with a KU instead of a G. So Kumail is my name. Uh, and just before we get started, I wanted to track back to where we started from yesterday. Um, if we remember um, when Bonnie Jane was uh, speaking the words before all else. She made sure to kind of send the appreciation and thanks to all of our relations that uh, sustain and continue us. All the elements, the creatures, the the winds, the earth, the water, um, the the sun, the moon, all of those elements of creation upon which we depend. So just to bring that back to our awareness and into into our space. And if you want to introduce yourself as well. I already introduced myself. Yeah. I'm Francis. <laughs> yes. Okay. So as mentioned, uh, our workshop was called Organizing 101, Strategy, Intersectionality, and Millennials. Uh, we're just going to begin by giving a quick overview of what we covered during the workshop. Uh, and then we'll get into some of the discussion that took place as well. Okay, so um, it was a very powerful, powerful workshop. Um, uh, Greta did an amazing job with it. It was great. Um, um, so it went over a, tons of different stuff um, um, based on her experience as an organizer. And so um, it went through um, like um, what is organizing and then basically setting a goal, um, tactics, and, and your strategy. Um, and I'm not get, going to get down into the nitty gritty of it right now, um, but it was, uh, it was a very good PowerPoint of, of lots of um, going through the tactics um, and kind of the ramifications of using tactics in different ways, um, various strategies, um, Kind of lots of ins and outs of the organizing game, um, and um, and then went into some other little discussions about like what intersectionality is, um, and and then I think a really another another really powerful part of the workshop was just um, at the end a little bit about organizing as a millennial, and and then it broke off into a kind of discussion among the whole group. Um, as to what we think needs to get done in the world. Um. Uh, yeah, and just to, uh, that was a kind of the general overview, then to highlight some of the, the points that stuck out. Um, she in invited us to ask uh, some key questions when we're organizing a campaign uh, in regards to how will the campaign concretely improve people's lives? How will the campaign provide people a sense of their power? How will the campaign alter the, the relations of power as well? So those were some of the questions she was inviting us to ask as we were organizing campaigns. Um, and then to build on some of the discussion as well that Francis was alluding to uh, in terms of combating apathy uh, just uh, and kind of within the context of this conference specifically being uh, surrounding peace and the building of peace and how campaigns surrounding uh, uh, causes that are more uh, directly in people's awareness, uh, like the, the uh, Greta had uh, participated in organizing a fracking, an anti-fracking campaign, and how uh, there was, uh, she was able to, and she and, her, and the team were able to galvanize a lot of community support for that. 
So it was raised uh, in the discussion about how uh, uh, organizing a, a peace movement can be more difficult, especially because uh, much of the implications of peace kind of are out of sight, out of mind, right? And they're, they're existential in nature and can kind of be, a, be beyond our awareness. So in response to that, uh, it was mentioned how war, the, 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 the peace movement and the anti-war movement can actually be the nexus of sorts and the rally call to help unify all of the other uh, uh, initiatives and movements and causes because of how war can impact the, the, the access to our civil liberties, how war can cause further degradation to our environment, um, amongst other things, right? So uh, one of the themes that has been ongoing is how do we find that unity which can allow us to have greater influence and greater greater uh, political will and political uh, power. So no, I'm keeping track. We're at about four. So um, I, I'm just going to wrap up right now and say that, yes, I believe in the potential of unity. And uh, I look forward to walking that path with all of you. Um, and um, one final note I'd like to say is um, um, maybe the strongest um, point that Greta made across to me was that um, in organizing, you need to meet people where you're at and meet people where they're at. Um, so um, I, know, I know there's a lot of energy in this conference, but it may seem a little daunting to take on the task of bringing it out into the outer world. And um, so just that one, one little bit of wisdom I wanted to leave with you. Okay. We're doing okay time-wise. We should, as long as we can uh, keep it, keep going as we're going. Um, divestment from war profiteers with Medea Benjamin. Got to ask somebody to uh, to be our report back person. So uh, I was part of the backup singing group, and uh, I'm Pocky Whelan from Code Pink, and uh, we had a, a great time. Uh, let me just ask you: How many of you have ever been involved? Are you now, or have you ever been involved in a divestment campaign? Yes. So so some of you were at the workshop, and others of you weren't. You were at other things. So this seems to be the thing that, that is really catching people's attention right now, and it's wonderful. Um, people are divesting from fossil fuels. Fossil fuel divestment, yes. Um, ban the bomb, divest, what was it? Uh, don't bank on the bomb. And uh, divestment from the war profiteers. So, so there's these, there's, uh, the BDS, yes, got BDSers here. Yeah. So, so this is um, this is something that's really um, wonderful in the sense that um, it doesn't take. It's not rocket science, but um, if you've got people with rocket science experience, they're help. They're helpful too. Um, please check out "Divest from the War," and I think we've got. We have many of these, so when you're uh, coming down before you leave today, you can pick them up right at this at this desk, right at the, the table in front. It's the vest from the war machine, and this is because I'm working with Code Pink. This is Code Pink's project, but what's wonderful is uh, those folks who were talking about intersectionality earlier, we've, we've managed to have these wonderful people who are in all three of the big divestment plans right now, the don't bank on the bomb, the, um, the work that the world beyond war and uh, Code Pink are working on together, that there's a wonderful synergy. So please, um, don't bank on the bomb, divest from war, and we listened to a few different people talk about their experiences in, in divestment, and the, the plans we have 
to further divest. And there, there are things you can do wherever you are. And that's one of the, the wonderful things about this. As long as you're living in a town or city, you can talk to your city about divesting. If you go to church somewhere, you can look at where your church divests. If you're still working or if you're working, lots of places have, in, have retirement funds. You can ask where those retirement funds are invested. And, and they're wonderful sites we talked about where you can look at how these places like Calvert, who has a great reputation as a uh, as a, one of the better places to to invest your money, as a, a, a good a financial institution, it ain't so good. So you can uh, find out a lot more. Um, and and not only you know we talk about putting our our money where our mouths are and and walking the talk and talking the walk. So. This is a great opportunity to do that and to do it expansively through whatever communities you're a part of. So thanks for the opportunity to do it, and it was wonderful to play with Medea and Farida and all of you who were there. Thanks. Okay, um, I was at this one, push pins holding up the map of empire, U.S. military bases around the world with Leah Bolger. Come on down. Hi, I'm Diane Blay from Fairfax, Virginia, and I sat in on Leah's presentation, and she really should be talking to you because I just took notes. But I will do the best I can to relay the information that I that I took uh, that I wrote down. So, um, first of all, she started with her bio and about why she joined the military. She joined for a job, which is how most people, is why I, I think most people join. Um, she's talked about the history of, of the bases starting in 1785. We're talking US. Um, and it was because of the West um, with the Indians. And the foreign bases started with FDR's trade of 50 um, destroyers, World War I destroyers for British access, for the at their colonies. And um, so that was the beginning of our foreign um, bases. And that after World War II, we re really moved in, uh, particularly in the lands that we had, had lost. And so we now have uh, lily pads, lily pads. Um, where, and that definition of that is when there are less than 200 um, soldiers, soldiers there, I guess, military people. And it's most, lily pads are mostly for the drones. She showed presentations of different, uh, well, a couple bases. Ramstein is the largest. It's an Air Force base, which has huge facilities for all the people there. Um, and overall, there are over 200,000 Americans at foreign bases. The US has a vision. It's called Full Spectrum Dominance Goals. And it, the goal is to be able to respond to anything within 24 hours. So um, the, they divided the world up. The U.S. has divided the world up, and I think to seven comms. Um, your com, I don't know. Anyway, Afrikan is the, is the latest. Um, there, she discussed reasons that countries want our U.S. bases, um, and it's mostly economical. And then there, pro and then she discussed problems with the uh, U.S. bases abroad, and she mentioned SOFA, and this protects servicemen, and, um, and it often says that the, America is not responsible for the environmental damage we do. We don't have to clean up, we can just leave the mess behind. So why shut a foreign bases? They cost the U.S. $150 billion per year, and um, every soldier and at a foreign base typically costs an additional $40,000, $100,000 per person. Um, there has been resistance throughout the world, and Okinawa is, is one of those prime areas. We have, there have been some successes um, in closing down bases. Um, Puerto Rico, um, Vieques, um, there were 19, in 1999 there were protests, and the U.S. pulled out in 2003, and there's Ecuador, and the Philippines, Subic Bay. Um, so there was a coalition against U.S. foreign military bases in Baltimore, and one of the 
uh, they passed five resolutions, and one was to have a resolu uh, global conference, and that will be in November. And oh, I have 20, I have, she had a sheet, and it is called um, U.S. Military Bases Overseas, the Facts, and I have sheets that I can leave here so people can pick up afterwards. Organizing locally to block national support for a war with Shreyash Jael. Hello, all you tired, uh, anxious, uh, committed people against war. There you go. Thank you, Mary Lou. Thank you, Mary Lou. <clears throat> My name is Dwyer Sullivan, I'm a retired high school teacher. Maybe I'm tired. <laughs> but um, our conference was uh, a very good sharing. We had three very uh, uh, excellent professors with us, uh, Cheryl Jura shared many of his experiences in trying to mobilize people, up to 200,000 once in India, and up to 88 different communities in the States, uh, organizing against the uh, Iraq war. And he worked with uh, a number of different countries, he said he's been in 73 different countries. So a very experienced person in trying to uh, organize youth and others uh, in anti-war activities. And we were also uh, treated to uh, Professor Warren Doran, who, uh, Walter Doran, he, as being a, I guess he said a wolf in sheep's clothing, <clears throat> being a professor at the Royal Military College, he gave us a number of insights as, okay, thank you. He claimed to be both, both a, uh, a sheep in wolf's clothing and a wolf in sheep's clothing. But uh, anyway, he had very interesting insights as to his trying to encourage the people to put <clears throat> humanity before country and talked about uh, some of the cyber secrecy that's needed, um, cyber security, excuse me, and also about some of the uh, opportunities that the military has developed to helping in other countries uh, regarding some laser stuff and some lighting materials. But he also gave us uh, a couple of insights as to how the, uh, perhaps a little bit of U.S. pressure helped other NATO countries with the time, with the NATO, with nuclear industry like Canada not to sign onto the uh, nuclear ban. And also in the room was uh, Professor Rose Dixon, who uh, has done quite a bit of work in Dyson. Good, you guys can read my notes better than I can. <laughs> and thank you. Uh, she's done a lot of work in addressing how uh, video materials um, increase the violence of our culture and how that uh, increases the militarism in North America. And so she's done uh, a lot of work uh, telling us about that. So for me, the high point of our gathering was uh, sharing from each of the people as to what each of them are trying to do from where they are to create a culture of peace. And uh, just some of the things mentioned one was uh, Jesse from Florida working on uh, educating people regarding restorative justice and any other alternatives to violence that we can uh, educate people toward. Um, <clears throat> several other people, including myself in Kitchener and Margaret in uh, Peterborough, are working locally to uh, coordinate the various peace activities that are happening in your own city. 
And in Owen Kitchener W, we have a KW Peace Group that involves about 10 to 15 different groups coming together monthly to share what's happening and support each other. There's a monthly peace vigil in uh, Peterborough that she is supporting. Uh, a huge concern by many, many people with the insistence of going to your MP. I think we had three members in our committee who were in uh, Kristen, Christine Freeland's uh, writing, and they're going to make arrangements to, uh, among other things, work to see what they can influence her to uh, get Canada to support the anti-nuclear ban. There are two members from the Canadian Initiatives for Peace, trying to set up a Department of Peace. Um, another person was really concerned about making sure the Arctic becomes a nuclear-free zone. Um, she was also interested in being in Ottawa to visit embassies encouraging us to do the same of countries, NATO countries that are nuclear, to see what we can, how we can influence them. Um, and I guess several people picked up on words you've heard throughout the day about the importance of talking to unlike-minded people and uh, connecting with them on internet and stuff and uh, the radios and uh, so, uh, to me, that was very important. I talk lots to like-minded people, but don't very often venture otherwise. So Doug mentioned particularly the importance of asking questions around tax resistance and seeing what we can do in that area. Another person was interested in attending the uh, party policy conferences and trying to introduce peace resolutions at that level. So I left uh, encouraged not tired, uh, with the efforts that uh, everybody is trying to make in their own area to develop a culture of peace, which we're not surrounded by yet, and which is needed to make a lot of the changes happen that we've talked about. So thank you, and carry on creating a culture of peace. <laughs> okay. We're holding together fine with time. If we can um, keep it up for the last two, we'll be great. Um, I agree we are not tired, not tired at all, but we, but we would like, uh, one sec, we would like to um, be able to take a 15 minute break before the next one, so if we can keep it on time, sure. Okay. You were the you were the um, the facilitator, right? Yeah. Okay, uh, say that again, and I'll say it into the mic to make sure. You have been to seventy three. Okay, so yes, um, thank you for clarifying that. Thank you. Okay, um, people's tribunals with Tom Kearns. Great. Thank you. I guess I'm upon my tiptoes for this one. Um, so this particular session, I asked a lot of questions because I had never heard of the Permanent People's Tribunal. Um, uh, Tom Kearns presented, it, he has a, a great PowerPoint presentation which maybe he would offer to make available to the uh, World Beyond War website and, and people could take a look at it there. But it's, a, it's basically a body of mostly judges uh, that are international and independent from, uh, from, from any sort of separate country. And there is a permanent people's tribunal that people can bring uh, reports or cases or complaints regarding human rights. It's a human rights organization. It's descended from the Russell, Sartre, something, other. Um, and uh, this particular uh, case that Tom Kearns and his organization um, are bringing is the first time they have basically tied um, human rights to, um, say this right, um, human rights tying it to fracking and climate change, basically saying that because of fracking and climate change, that is a human rights issue. So this was kind of a test case to bring 
a very, uh, very a huge amount of work, a lot of testimony, um, art and music, um, and uh, and they. I guess for me, the takeaway, one of these things uh, that I took away from this particular tribu tribunal, which is still has not rendered a final decision. They've rendered a preliminary finding, which is gives hope for their recognizing that, in fact, um, there are huge human rights violations related to fracking and climate change. So that's a, a huge thing that they've made that connection. Um, it was done completely online. There were these 10 judges there all over the world. Um, this whole thing had to be done in two different languages. And um, because it was all online, and that apparently the judges initially were not in favor of doing this online, but they kind of were convinced to give it a try. And then the judges, in fact, commented that, in fact, they felt that doing the whole tribunal online was a big success. So, you know, reducing that carbon footprint, it's a, a good model for any of these other kind of international tribunals where you're trying to really gather evidence and present a case that then can be used. And I think the other optimistic piece of this was that this whole case is all has been documented, officially transcribed. It's going to be available to uh, people, for example, uh, law professors who want to use this case to, uh, you know, teach a course. Um, it, what the connection I also made was in in the other workshop about the the difficulties and how much work you have to do to bring a complaint or, or file a report with the uh, ICC, and the importance of really grounding your case and having all your facts. That when you, uh, you when because of the work they've done in this um, bringing this case to this tribunal that that information is now available and that can be used for example to take something to the ICC so there's I that's just a piece of this so I would encourage people to talk to Tom Kearns about this the work that he's done here okay um, this is the last one, and then after this, we are taking a very quick break and meeting back here for 6 o'clock. Um, and um, I just want to thank everybody in advance of the, of the final one. Um, so, so much substantial, serious information here, and um, it's really great. So thank you to everybody. Um, last up, Peace Education Approaches for the Abolition of War with Tony Jenkins and William Timpson. There you are. Thanks. Hello, my name's Rose, and uh, I was at this workshop with uh, two very dedicated educators. Um, it seems like they've delved deep into how they wanted to approach um, peace education and also into developing it. Um, <laughs> sorry, Bill Timpson, he uh, is working full-time in Colorado. However, he does have a grant from Fulbright and two Rotary uh, scholarships to be able to um, teach peace education, is that right? Um, in Burundi and uh, at a university there. It's a th and uh, what I'd like to say, I'm kind of starting <laughs> in the middle, is that um, what he found is that in teaching a class during the Bush era when um, it, was, it was being considered to, to go into uh, invade Iraq, he um, brought this up with his students and found that there was reluctance to talk about it. And he found that disconcerting. And uh, this, I guess, I'm assuming led to sort of efforts to be able to discuss issues like that that are important to the children, to the country. And, and what he wanted to do, I guess, was to address that and to be able to talk about peace, I guess, in, in a few to be said very quickly. So I guess what I found interesting about what he said is that he felt that education, peace education should be considered for all subjects, um, not just as a subject in itself. And he also found that to, be, to teach students to be able to take knowledge, analyze it, 
um, discuss it, and then be able to apply it actually in real life. And, and, and this would create sort of critical, uh, critical thinking, I guess, also but creative thinking and, 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 and develop ideas to be able to bring about peace, to support peace. And um, yeah, he brought up images of, of communities that were suffering, um, violence in, protest, in protests, violence from the police, and he considered how, you know, how can we handle that? from, a, I guess, from a peace education standpoint. And um, a beautiful story was that in, in Thailand, uh, he had arrived and, and went to this, well, there, were, there had been protests, and I'm not sure, and, the, and, and uh, went to a, a place where there were teddy bears and flowers at a barricade. And there were policemen. And one listener in this workshop was astute to say, well, wasn't that a visual cue to, to, to sort of lessen, lessen this sort of response of violence? All right. <laughs> so. <laughs> um. So I guess what he'd really like to see, his vision of peace education, is to be able to synthesize the information, uh, take on cases, um, discuss them, see how we can put that into our own lives, into our own thinking, our own responses, learn how to, to not react but to think and, react and, and to think clearly and to respond in, an, in a civil way. And um, he also speaks about reconciliation and negotiation and teaching about diversity and um, experiential learning. So uh, this is quite, I guess, radical. He found that there are few universities that are, are teaching peace education in this way. And um, obviously, I think we'd all like to see peace education in our education, in our schools, and, and, and in a way that we can actually become peacemakers at, at, at any given time or when necessary. Um, what am I saying? I think also I found it interesting that he mentioned to us that we could, uh, in our city, go to a Rotary Club and see what is possible from that club to support peace education. Their mission is peace. So I encourage all of you to do that. Um, all right. So our second speaker, Tony, are you there? Hi. Um, 15 seconds ago, I found what, I, what I found interesting about him was that he wanted to, um, the approach to teaching peace, not to just give, you know, talk about it, and then I think he was trying to express how important it is to create a presence of peace. Uh, an example was that he went to a meeting and there were mandalas on the table where people colored and they sat, they arrived, and, um, and this created a different kind of feeling and approach and, in, in the classroom. Um, sorry, I'm going very quickly through my notes here. And also to use y your own experience. Um, anything, what, what made you, you know, pursue peace being here at this conference? What is in, in your lives an experience that, that changed you to become more peaceful, to, to, to create, uh, to be a peace activist that you could share with others in order to, to inspire them as well? And that was brought up. Um, Tony, did you want to come up in the last few seconds because I'm not doing it? Okay, thank you. Um, I just want to say that I kidnapped an MP this afternoon and um, I was just on my room down the road picking up something and um, Adam Vaughan who's a member of parliament for uh, here, knocked on the door. And I said, oh, hi. And he wanted to talk to me. And I said, well, can you come down to our No War conference, please? And so I introduced him to, and he did. Yeah, I introduced him to David Swanson and a couple of other people. And then I ran up to the, I was actually on my way to the Code Pink um, workshop. <laughs> I wanted to find Tamara. And so I ran up there and sh I, 
I grabbed Tamara and um, we followed him down. He was told me he was going down to the Sin and Redemption pub to meet his people. So I brought Tamara down there and, uh, and she gave him a 10 minute spiel with his supporters around, so yay. Okay, wasn't this wonderful? Um, I just want to give, ask us to give ourselves a hand for um, what we've done here. What we saw here is the work of all of us. Um, we are the people, we will do this. And uh, Liz, who's Quaker from um, New Zealand, and I'm Quaker from Toronto here, we would like to get other Quakers for a photo, just here at the break, okay? Out at the front. And I have the petition uh, for the Parliament for Canadians to sign about nuclear weapons on the table up here. Thank you. And uh, we'll be meeting back here in 15 minutes. Thank you, everybody.